part two of Caroline, Dr. Muscle White. Yes. Uh, we're shifting from inclusion to literacy 101, what we can do as parents to help support our children, uh, learning to be readers and writers and thinking of themselves as readers and writers. So with that, y'all already know who Dr. Muscle White is. I'm just gonna turn it back to her and we'll go from there. Good, and will you just hand these out so people can see those as, we, as I talk? So just like they just go around everywhere. So you guys saw my information. Now, I thought this was a 55 minute session and then I looked at the schedule when I got here, it's 45. Oh my goodness, put your seatbelts on. <laughs> okay, here we go. So this is a wonderful flow chart for conventional interventions. I'm gonna be talking about emergent interventions today. <coughs> so does your, does your child know most of the letters most of the time? If no, that leads us down the emergent path. Do they actively engage during shared reading, meaning that they initiate with their communication device, making comments and asking questions and answering questions? Um, do they have a full, a robust full means of communication and interaction and understand that writing involves letters and words? And so I'm gonna talk today primarily about emergent, oops, interventions, but um, I, but some of these strategies are going to be helpful for conventional students as well. So I, a lot of you have seen this literacy wheel, the idea that reading, writing, speaking, and listening are just intricately related. And I'm going to try to point out some of the ways that they are related. Uh, the big idea, more is more. I alluded to this in the last session, so if you were here, you heard it, that whether we have a high-tech system, so... Uh, for example, Kai is using words for life with 84 symbols, um, or do we have a uh, light tech system such as a robust system such as POD? We want to make sure that whichever kind of system students are using, and by the way, I put this in your Dropbox, it's a link to lots of paper based displays. So for example, here's one from Touch Chat from Saltillo that has a core board plus lots and lots of language to use. So if you don't have a high-tech system yet, here's a robust light-tech system. Um, and that's in your handout. Um, so I just want, I'm gonna say that for literacy, we need that strong language base. So it's really helpful if your student has a robust vocabulary and including the alphabet. So I'm gonna talk first about shared reading. We're gonna look at the, I'm gonna try to hit most of the emergent um, supports that we would have for instruction. I'm gonna talk about things that you can advocate for at school and also things you can do at home to empower your students. Because I know you don't have total control over what's happening at school. So I'm gonna share, share with you what I hope will be happening at school, but knowing that if you're just frustrated that you can't make that happen, you can do this at home, okay? So repetition with variety and shared reading. Did you know that typically developing children from literate homes have heard their favorite stories read 200 to 400 times? Raise your hands if you believe that because you have personally read a story to your child. To this is really important. So some of the research tells us that students who use AAC sometimes don't get a repeated reading of the same book 200 to 400 times for multiple reasons, but the, one of the main reasons is that our students who with AAC devices sometimes can't ask for that, you know, good night moon again, right? That they, you know, and P.S., as parents, after the 57th time, we kind of try to, like, talk them into a different book, like, oh, no, we don't run read. And, and children with good language skills just, like, advocate for themselves. No, we will be reading good night moon tonight again. And, and they insist, you know, so we need to make sure we're doing that. And I'm going to also talk about wide reading. But right now I'm talking about repeated readings, the same story over and over. I love this research about the million word gap. I think this is something to share with all families. Young children whose parents read to them five books a day enter kindergarten having heard 1.4 million more words than kids who are never read to. OMG, right? Really interesting uh, study. Simple, predictable books for younger students. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you hear? I mean, what do you see? I see a blue horse looking at me. Blue horse, blue horse, what do you see? I see a yellow duck looking at me. So what we're changing on every page is the color and the animal. 
And so they're getting to, to hear those types of things. But there's also lots of powerful rhythm and some really good rhyming. Includes some color words. Look, me, what, you are all words that are included in that. So that's great if you have younger kids. If you have older students, you're going to need to find other books. And I'm going to pass this book around and then give it away at the end. This is a book that I wrote. Thank you, Vanna. Um, so actually, let's just pass both of them around. I'll let you take the cover off and throw the the CD up on the table. Um, so these, this is a book called Learning to Work. And it's about transition stories about you know going to um, that your students are working and it's got some predictable stories for older kids. I've also done things like raps, uh, like wrote this book in like 1983 or, or 93. So here's a book, going to a party, just can't wait, putting on deodorant, gonna look great. Okay, there's a predictable book for older students. That's the raps book, okay? Um, going to a party, just can't wait. Doing my makeup, gonna look great. I mean, is this like the perfect day to be doing that book? We better be doing all that stuff, right? So that's a predictable book for older kids. Here's another predictable book for older kids. Pizza today, what should we get for the pizza today? How about pickles? No way. How about cheese? That's okay. And then we have that slot filler. So that's for my wraps book. And by the way, because you guys are here, um, for the next three months, you could get any of my CDs for $5 instead of $35. So, but, but now I'm going to show you free ones. I don't want you to have to buy stuff, but I'm just saying if you liked that. So Tar Hill Readers, this amazing website. Raise your hands if you have not been, don't, do not know about Tar Hill Reader. Oh, fresh meat. I love it. Okay, Tar Hill Reader is like one of the best sites on the planet. Tar Hill Reader has, I don't know, it's like maybe 80,000 books now that were written just for our students. It's, um, you can have voices, you can download them to a PowerPoint. They now made a connector to Pictello, so you can download it, just Google this. Convert Tar Hill Reader to Pictello. I don't know what the website is, and I just Google it every time, and then I just fill in the URL for that Tar Heel Reader book, and now I can open it up in Pictello, and the child can have it on their device anytime. So lots of great books that are of age respectful for older kids. Here are some of the authors that I like a lot on Tar Heel Reader. Um, Read a book is per my, one of my personal favorites. Um, he's so funny. Jane Farrell, um, I have a lot of books, and I have books I've written with students I work with, and also books I wrote for um, various projects. So raise your hands if you have not seen any of the uh, webinars that Aaron Sheldon, Maureen Nevers, and I did at angelman.org. Uh, we did 43 free webinars on literacy and AAC. And so I wrote books to go along with most of those units, a lot of the units. So see if you can find a core word. This is just a screenshot of a few of my books. See if you can find a high frequency, really high frequency word you think you might have see repeated multiple times in a book. What's a word? Look up here, look at the titles and tell me a core word you think you could, could, uh, could model using one of my books. Don't. Go. There. Like. Where. Can. Stop. That. Who. Right? So who can is just a really funny story about who can sing, she can, who can dance, he can, who can, 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 and at the end you have women doing a can, can. So just you know, trying to make it a little edgy, a little fun for older students. Um, so really fun ones. So when I'm doing shared reading, one of the things we really focus on is giving opinions. That is such an important life thing. It's a social thing. How many of you would say that your students are really pretty darn social? Right? It's a, it's a huge strength. So giving opinions plays into their strengths. If you can teach your students to give opinions. So here's a light tech board that I put in your Dropbox in case you um, don't have a, a rich system for right now. And you can see, so what are some positive comments up here? 
that whole top row. I like that. Thumbs up. Awesome. Great. Now, you could change that out. I mean, I have one student who wasn't using the comments or advice until her peers got in, and they decided, let me model, let me put in some words. They asked her, hey, can we put epic on there? And she's like, yeah. And they put epic, and then they're modeling. When they're watching a video, they're, they're modeling epic. Or they have somebody who, you know, hey, who comes in wearing a really cool new haircut. Epic. And she started using it because it was the language of her peers. So making sure we customize, right? Um, so the, the, uh, the opinion and feelings page give us lots of ways to comment. So we're reading um, Journey to the Center of the Earth, but now our water is gone. We must find water soon. So here are things I would be modeling. It's, this doesn't just happen. You've got to spend time modeling this. Um, Uh-oh, no, not good. Help, drink, yikes thirsty. Those are lots of things you could model to talk about that page in that book, okay? Um, I, I love this book. If you have a, a, a child who's in a wheelchair, you've got to read Wheeling by Read a Book. But notice the little little sign. This is a caution. You've got to, you've got to go in and say you want to turn, you can read all the books, not even the restricted books. Because it, yeah. So if you have teenagers, they're going to love that one. In fact, I wasn't thinking I'd have time, but we're just going to make time because it's a really great book. So consulting over student stories, wheeling. Oh, seriously. Um, do you see wheeling? Oh, I know it's under it's under um, PowerPoints. There it is. Okay, so here's wheeling. I want you to make a positive comment or a negative comment. Wheeling. By read a book. Read a book is David Copenhaver. That's his pen name. Uh, wheeling speed. Wheeling read. Uh-oh, I think wheeling peed. <laughs> right? That's why it's C for caution. And so think about, ha, raise your hand if your student would like this book. Because it is, a, right? It's funny. And so we can go, uh-oh, or look, or look out, or... Wheeling Swing, King Dingling, Tennis, Venice, Menace, Spite, Kite, Absolute Delight, Like, Cool, okay? So we pause and let you make comments. Goat, Boat, or we just model them. Wheeling Prayer, Wheeling Stare. I have a lot of students who love making comments about that. Look out! Uh-oh! Wheeling Shop, Stop, Pop. Dance, pants, balance, flowers, shower. I don't go fast like this with kids. I just want you to see. Um, wheeling scoops, maybe wheeling pumpkin poops. Did we just suck your kids in again? They were kind of ignoring, and now we talked about pumpkin poops. We got them, right? Um, wheeling here, wheeling there, wheeling almost everywhere. Who would dare, being fair, think we're confined to a wheelchair. When I showed this, one of my students in a who was using a communication device in a wheelchair said, me, go. Like she wanted to go there. She wants to do this. I told her mom she hasn't signed her up for lessons yet. <laughs> but this is the kind of book that's really fun for commenting. So that's your homework assignment. So I've talked about repeated books. We read the same book multiple times for different purposes. Maybe we're reading it to comment. Maybe we're reading to put in some high-frequency words, um, et cetera. But we also want to support their vocabulary. Because remember, 6,000 by 6, that's what we'd like to have, that our students understand 6,000 words by age 6. And if your students are older, we're still working on that. So we can help students grow their vocabulary by wide reading. Um, key issue for our students who aren't speaking and aren't reading independently, because research shows that one of the key ways students learn to um, learn new words is through reading. And so if our, student, our students who are, are avid readers in high school are the ones who have a better vocabulary when they graduate. So, um, you know, the words like they roared their terrible roars, they gnashed their terrible teeth. That's the kind of thing that we can talk about. What does it mean to roar? A lion roars, you know. That, he doesn't look like a lion, but he's roaring too. They gnash their teeth. You know what that means? It goes, Argh. ooh, that was scary, right? Um, so to summarize shared reading, we want to do wide reading. Lots of different books because that builds vocabulary. It helps build world knowledge, which our students learn, need. But repeated reading that same book many times 
builds print awareness. It helps them use language to retell it. It helps them take ownership. So that's what we see happening with typically developing kids. When we read that book like you know 200 times, by the 200th time, they're starting to take over parts of that book, OK? Um, I talked about Strive for Five in the last session. Think about pick a book and pick five words that you want to model in that book and put a post-it on the book so you can just look at it. And yes, I did change this one. If in case you're looking at the handout, it's different. I changed things this morning. Think core, only one noun. So let's say you're reading, um, you're reading uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's not about bears and chairs. Don't be spending time looking for bears and looking for chairs because those aren't words you need as often. Here are some words you might be modeling. She, like, eat, not like, finish, good, right? Those are the kinds of words that, that are all day words that she eats that, uh, she eats that uh, porridge and she says good or she says not like. Those are the words we're modeling. We're not modeling porridge. You know, we're not trying to find, you know, uh, oatmeal or something to substitute for porridge. We're looking, we're, we're hitting the high spots, words that are all day words, not words that are just this book words, okay? So that was, um, was uh, shared reading. Now let's look at self-directed reading, students reading and enjoying. And what I'm going to do is talk about some of our students don't really love books, and we find that when there are books about them, they're much more likely to love them. Or books about people they love, they're much more likely to love it. So the first one is going to be a five-sentence story, something your care, child cares about, right? Five sentence, and turn it into a book. It might be light tech. You might use an app like Pictello or Kid in Story. You might put it on Tar Heel Reader. Um, here's Pictello, which I love for all these reasons. I can use pictures and videos, etc. One of my absolute favorite apps. Um, here's Lily Great's Surf Day. I went to Malibu. I put on my wetsuit. I picked my surfboard. I surfed the big waves. I got a trophy. Do you see how some of these transitions are bold? I stayed in this one. I don't know why. They, they, you can really see when it changes. I got a trophy. I was wiped out. And there's that humor at the end. I love stories with humor at the end because we're more likely to have people read it again and again and again because of the humor. Think about also her peers who laugh because they love that, you know, that you wipe out when you surf. And so they get that and they're laughing at the book because it's, it's that double entendre. So things like that can make it really powerful. Um, so to summar it, it's, summarize, it's great for engagement because it's personally meaningful. It used that black background and yellow letters, so the words pop. Um, but it's great for independent reading because it's accessible. We can have language added to read it to her, and it's personal. So she's going to want to read it over and over and over. Um, here's Lucas. Um, Lucas lives in Europe, and he, this is his first snow. So we set this one up as a, a book, but also a social script. So he's... Uh, sharing this with a friend and then having it as a social interaction. Guess what I got to do last weekend? I'll give you hints. It was outside, it was fun, and it was cold. And the person's making guesses, and then he tells you the next part. I went skiing with my family. And maybe they guessed skiing, and maybe they didn't. Did you ever get to go skiing? We're turning it over. We're doing a turnover, so your, your friend is talking to you about this book. My dad and I played in the snow. Do you like to play with your dad? It was carnival. I got to dress up like the Hulk. Who's your favorite character? An open-ended. My friend dressed up like Princess Sophia. Do you like princesses? I mean, I would say no, I don't. But how many kids love princesses? So that really interested them. Well, that's all. It was a fun day. Later, dude. So it's great, again, for engagement because it's personally meaningful. Same thing. I, like, I just cut and pasted that from Lily Grace's. Same thing. But his is different because it's good for independent reading, but also good for shared reading because it has those turn takings. So it's good for a partner to re read it with somebody. He can read it with his family. He can read it with his friends. Every time there's a turnover, they're encouraged to jump in, right? It's great for independent reading, again, accessible, etc. I just love this. So um, uh, Isabel, who might be watching out there, um, Edito's mom is Isabel, and she lives in Guatemala. Here. She's here. 
Oh, good. Okay. Well, she wrote this. She came to AAC in the desert, and she was talking about how her son didn't really love books very much, and we gave a lot of ideas of how to make books, you know, personally meaningful, how to make them more, um, you know, more um, laminated and, and, you know, or durable paper, et cetera. And she wrote this to me, and I made this into, an, into a quote on my Pinterest page of AAC and literacy quotes. Life is short, and in the end, it's not about who has the nicest, untouched, most perfect books, but who has explored the most, enjoyed the most, and learned the most in advanced and emergent literacy. So your homework is to do a five-sentence story, OK? Um, Let's jump to independent writing with the alphabet. So these are pictures taken from the Angel and Camp in Ontario. And you can see lots of students getting to explore the alphabet in different ways. And for some time, some of them, it might have been the first time they really had to, got to access the alphabet. And guys, it's important to know it's OK to scribble. Like, we forget this when kids are older. We think they have to do it right. No, they don't. If they're starting to learn the alphabet, they get to scribble, and they get to scribble for a long time. How many years do typically developing kids get to scribble? They get to scribble for years. They start when they're about one, and nobody expects them to write anything that's meaningful until they're at least five. They get four years that people allow them to just scribble with feedback, though. So if this little girl hadn't drawn on her baby sister, her, if this had been on a piece of paper, mama might be saying something like, oh, you made a Y. You know what? Y is for yellow, and you love yellow. You, uh, the Y is for yellow. You know, the sun is yellow. So done, boom, a little bit of informative feedback, and we're done. You made a Y, here's what it could stand for. That's the kind of thing we do naturally for kids who are young and scribbling. Older students who are playing around with their alternative pencils, people think it should spell something, and they kind of try to shut it down. No, scribble's great. We just need to give informative feedback. And we need to know what they're writing about so we can do a better job of informative feedback. So I have a Pinterest page for accessing the alphabet. I use a lot of alphabet boards. I put these in your Dropbox. Uh, so this is the QWERTY board, and of course, higher uh, uppercase on the back, uh, lowercase on, on the um, front, and this one is an ABC writing order. This would be the one I would try first, because that's what we hope your students are going to be using eventually, is a keyboard. Uh, if that's not working, then you might try a flip book, so an alphabet flip book, where if you're trying to find the, uh, uh, the letter to write the word hi, I could be saying, let's see, it's not on this page, I need to turn the page, looking for the letters to, oh. I was using this. Looking for the letters to spell hi is one of these. Thank you. It's one of these letters. E, no. F, no. G, no. H, yes. Let's try it. H, hi. Yes, let's write an H for hi. So if I'm modeling, that's what I could do. Lots of modeling, or students can just pick a letter. You know, when we did Alphabet Action Man, they might have picked D, and then we did let's dance, dance, dance for D, okay? So that's the alternative pencil print, print flip chart. Now, I did something called the writing pyramid about 10 years ago. And we really eventually want students to be using the alphabet, but we also want them to be using what I call core plus content. So core is all those high frequency words, can, get, do, not, want. And content would be your categories, like clothing and food and animals. And then word banks means, I gave you some symbols, and you're going to put them together to write something. I try to limit word banks because you don't own that language. It's going to go away. And I learned this about uh, 35 years ago. We were doing an activity where we had some words, and we were writing Valentines to uh, cartoon characters. And I had the words pretty, silly, ugly. And the student loved the word ugly and thought it was hysterical and he wanted ugly in his Valentine for goofy, right? Just thought it was so funny. Next day he comes to school and he's eye pointing and he's going, uh, uh, uh. And what he wants is the choice board that, that had been, um, had, had we'd had the word ugly on, it's hanging up on the wall. And there's no symbol on it. And he's going, ah, ah. And luckily, one of the aides figured out, she's like, oh, I think you want the word ugly. Is that what you want? And he's like, yeah. so excited. Ah. You know, sorry, buddy. You don't own ugly. You just got to rent it for the 15 minutes we did that activity. So when you bring in symbols for an activity that's temporary, that's not 
being as helpful because they can't, he wanted ugly and he didn't own it. That was the day I realized we really have to have kids have a rich vocabulary. And if he found ugly on his device, then I can show him how to get back there, right? So let's just look at this with Sadie. So Sadie was in first grade when this story happened. They did a journal across a year. And so um, in, she's, it was in first grade, fully included, using Proloquo to go. She used the light tech alphabet, this one, the, um, QWERTY, and she also um, used the alphabet on her Proloquo app. So here she is in September, that's the first time they did it. So the idea is at the end of every month, they're gonna draw a picture uh, and they're gonna write about it. Uh, Sadie isn't uh, good at drawing, so she can't draw anything representational. So her aide drew a, 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 a stick figure of a girl and the sun. And then her aide wrote, this is me in September, and her aide wrote Sadie and September. And, 80, and so what Sadie was doing was making marks, and you can see she has some circles, and she has some lines. And so where is she on the writing pyramid? Is she writing with the alphabet? Not yet. Is she using her communication device to write? Not yet. Is she using word banks? No. Okay, so let's look at November. The gap between Sadie and her peers is getting wider because you know that by November, her peers are write, writing some letters that mean something based on the picture they drew. Sadie's not able to make a picture, so we don't have context to guess. So I could say, oh, Sadie, you made an X, and I wonder if that stands for xylophone. I mean, I have no idea what it could stand for because I don't know what she's writing about, right? She doesn't have a topic. I can't say, you made an O and that stands for Oscar the Grouch because there's no picture. I don't have any context and I'm not sure of those that she's making letters. Let's see what happened. I went there in December and did a training for her team. So let's look at how it looks different in January. So her mom sent in some photos that were personally meaningful, and Sadie picked a picture. So now we have some context. And she chose these words on her communication device, who you play with, who, dad, dad, who you play, page. And so they took a screenshot of the message window and printed it, and then she pasted it on. Really great. So now she's writing, and where is she now? Is she writing with the alphabet? Not yet. Is she writing using her device? Absolutely. So she's on here. So they sent it to me and said, how would you change it? And I said, I'd do two things. For one, I would take the symbols off the message window because communication, symbols are for communication. I wouldn't you know, take the symbols off her device for communicating. Symbols are for communication, text is for literacy. I want her to see text, even if somebody else has to read it to her, I want her to understand that what she wrote can be read, that it's meaningful. So, they, so let's look and see what they did. First of all, let's see where she is. She's exploring her writing tools. Um, she's uh, using symbolic language to generate print. She is selecting a symbol to make a comment. So she's already over here on this adapted bridge, which is in your Dropbox, okay? Let's look at her in February. I also, the second thing I said, so the first thing I said is, take the symbols off the message window, not off the, not off the communication part, but just off the message window. And always model, when you're modeling, always model that she should be, can also write with the alphabet. And so this time she wrote, what you do, Auntie Pam, pizza, pizza, cook, that looks really yummy was a single um, message, <clears throat> was, you know, one button. I like this. And then she went to her, they said, oh, would you like to write with your, with your um, alphabet? And she typed a B and they said, Sadie, you made, wrote a B and I wonder if that B was for baking because you and your aunt were baking pizza. And, and Sadie was like, sure. Now, was it intentional? It doesn't matter. We just connected it to B is for bake, okay? Um, the next month, this is what she picked, and she chose to go to the alphabet. My feeling is that probably she's noticing her friends are writing with the alphabet, and she wants to be like her friend. And she wrote M M N P P I O uh, I U G D D, and her uh, para said. Uh, or her speech therapist was talking with her and said, "Sadie, you have a lot of M's, and I wonder." And Sadie 
just took her finger and pointed to the picture of her mother. Okay, that means she's definitely intentional. She's definitely writing an M for a reason. And she said, great, can you show me anything else? I see some P's. And she just paused and Sadie touched the picture of Paige. And I see D's and she touched the picture of dad, right? So she's starting to become conventional. That, that's faster than a lot of students we work with. And they were doing lots of other things that I'm gonna show in the next part. But she's really, really growing and she's moving forward on her device. Because guys, it's okay to scribble, remember? But give informative feedback. Give informative feedback, it's very important. When you're scribbling with the alphabet, we need to have a context, we need to know what you're writing about, and then I can give you ideas of what it might mean. The last area is alphabet and phonological awareness. I've, um, there's a screenshot that just shows a lot of alphabet books. I did a tip about that at AAC Intervention. I did a tip about don't do letter of the week, and then I did a tip about how alphabet books can be really great for older students. And so like there's one that I love, there's a frozen alphabet some of your kids would like. But there's a wonderful one, uh, the ABCs of fashion. A is for accessories. B, I don't think I have that, no, I don't. A is for accessories, B is for boardwalk. No, B is for, I don't remember, and C is for catwalk, right? So just really fun thinking about what are your students interested in. If it's the ABC, if it's trains, make an ABC book about trains or go look for one on Tar Heel Reader. Um, one of the things you should do is one to two minute models, not long, like literally, definitely no more than two minutes, using whatever alternative pencil your child or your student is using. So you could do things like you're thinking out loud, you wanna just make a list, so put one item on a list, right? Um, so we're thinking about, uh, oh my gosh, hey guys, we, I'm going to the grocery store, I need help, and you can have all of your students model using your child's alternative pencil. So if your child is using this QWERTY, then you have siblings modeling that they want to do, mom, get pizza. And so they're just like, okay, what letter do I need to write for pizza? And they're trying to find the P for pizza. Um, and that then your, your student is going on their device and maybe they pick out, they pick that they want, um, you know, macaroni and cheese, and then you ask them to try to find the M for macaroni so you can write that down. We're gonna write a note for the door, like, oh, you know what, we need to make a note for the door. We need to tell people to be quiet. You know, we need to tell people, shh, what letters do I need to write, shh. Um, a note for the door in school or home. A note to your grandparents, et cetera. You're writing a communication like, oh, we need to tell your teacher that we are gonna be skiing and we're not gonna be at school next week. Oh, maybe we shouldn't tell her about skiing. But we'll just say, I'm not gonna be at school. I will be gone. What letter do I need to write gone, okay? Um, et cetera. So let's think of some family games. I think find that letter. It's like that scavenger hunt I just did. So your student takes their alternative pencil and they find F and everybody is running around the house trying to some, find something that starts with F and bringing it back. So an actual object or a picture of an object. Um, and so then you take pictures of those and that's where you add to that alphabet book, that personal alphabet book. Alphabet Action Man that I showed earlier where you're saying, uh, find the letter M, and now we're gonna march, march, march for M, etc. cetera. Uh, family games, whose name is it? We pick a letter and we try to think who has that letter in their name, and we write down the names, and we try to find uh, that letter in pe names of people they care about. I just find that um, many of the students I work with who have Angelman syndrome really care about other people, and names are really engaging to them, people's names they care about, and so this is a fun thing to do. Again, make a book. Um, another one that I have found really fun, my grandkids just adore Hangman, and so whenever we go out to eat, we try to find places that have paper tablecloths so we can write on the tablecloth and play Hangman. You don't have to know the alphabet to play Hangman. So we have a message, and you're guessing the letter G, and I'm like, okay, let's see. No, I do not have a G. There is no G. And so you make a G, and you exit out. You know, you put it in the little box, and you exit out, and you're like, ah, oh, you got I had to add an I on your, on your head. No, because guess what? You guess the letter G. I'm going to turn the page. I'm going to turn the page. E, F, G, no G. So whatever they're doing, you're just having them guess a letter and you're talking about that letter. And then if you write the letter in, you write it into the right place in the 
in the hangman, and then you say, oh, yes, look, here's a G. There are two of them. G, G. Here's another G. You did a good one. You guessed G. -G. Um, tongue twisters. This is t- like it's Christmas. Ask everybody in your family for Christmas to make up a tongue twister about themselves and take a picture and make a tongue twister page. And then you're going to a- make a tongue twister book for your child, right? And so we have this. Oh, and if your student, if your child is fully included, please ask the peers to do this. So Jillian jumped into a jiggling jar of jam. I mean, they're just really silly. Who student would like, who has a child that would love those silly, silly, silly things, right? And then put those on a Big Mac. Oh, by the way, I happen to have talking bricks. These would be great for putting tongue twisters on. It'd be great for doing, my letter is D, when we're uh, coming up with that and we put a post-it on it. So I have talking bricks. This talking brick is going to the person whose birthday is closest to Christmas without going over because you rarely get good presents. So who has a birthday after December 15th? Okay, what's your birthday? 22nd. 22nd? 22nd, honey, you're a winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay. Um, that's from AbleNet, and they, we had the, their catalogs passed around. The last thing I want to talk about is that you need to advocate in school for a comprehensive literacy curriculum. There, there are a few of them. Uh, Meville to Weville is one. I'm going to show a couple that I, I like a lot. Reading Avenue is new from, uh, from uh, Boardmaker. And if you own Boardmaker online, you can get this for free. If your student is nine or under, this is a great curriculum for them. Uh, is to, um, Developed in consultation with Dr. Karen Erickson, who's the, at the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies. It gives three years of instruction, about 1,000 hours for beginning uh, readers. Little more than just following lesson guides. It's really helpful to deliver evidence-based practice. And the, the books are, um, a, a lot of them were written by Maureen Donnelly, and she's really clever. And so there's a lot of pretty fun books in there. Some of them she didn't write, but the ones she wrote are very fun. Um, the, if they're 10 and up, I really like Readtopia. Um, it was developed in consultation with Dr. Karen Erickson, with me, and with uh, Jerry Stemich. And I was passing around the graphic novel that goes with, for example, um, the, uh, I think I was passing around Journey to the Center of the Earth. So did everybody get to see the graphic novel? So that just showed the seven levels, uh, I actually I think six of the seven levels. So you can see it went from very emergent to early conventional. Uh, this is based on literature, so like Treasure Island or, or Anne of Green Gables, et cetera. And so we, it has activities for science, life skills, social studies, math, and English language arts, but it's all based on literature with those uh, six levels of graphic novels. And then there's all these types of informational text, and there's four levels for each one, so this goes from emergent to, to conventional, and uh, lots of amazing videos. Oh my gosh, I just love the videos. And then phonics activities ranging from alphabet instruction, if your student doesn't know alpha, the alphabet, there's some really great alphabet instruction, to, to making words, if your student knows the letters but doesn't really know how to use them to write words um, and read words, and then up to a more, um, more sophisticated word study. So these are some of, of the units with that one. Don't forget about AC in the desert. Don't forget to, uh, the silent auction. I knitted about 35 things that are going to be out there. Please bid. And here's the URL for this one. And look, I even have time left. <laughs> At least it said I did. Do so I we have about something? seven minutes for questions. Anybody with Actually, a question? Actually, six, because they wanted it to be over at 12.45, and I don't want to keep people from lunch. Twelve. Okay, six minutes for questions. I mean, I can stay later. I just don't want you all to miss your lunch. Great. I'm coming. How much uh, receptive language are kids getting from passive screen time? Let's say they're watching oh, a movie. I think very minimal. Very minimal. Yeah. Yeah, passive screen time, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I, I mean, I, you know, everybody's different, but I do not feel like that's really supporting literacy much. Thank you. Other questions? 
Interactive screen time is very different, okay? And we can make videos that support learning. So for example, I might make a video that says, wow, Sadie, you wrote uh, P and P was for page. And then I'm underlining and doing arrows and it's personally meaningful, but just general screen time doesn't, doesn't thrill me. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it's about the interaction and about very personally meaningful and then it's thoughtfully presented and planning to teach you language or literacy skills. So I, I just, you know, and I'm not saying kids never learn anything from it. Of course they do. There's incidental learning. But we do know that students who have more significant disabilities are not as good at incidental learning. And so, yeah, I, I, I worry about it. Yeah, next question. I have a question back here okay. exactly where you cannot see us. Yes, okay. <laughs> so um, my daughter has uh, the Novo chat, and I see you with the Pectello. I hadn't uh, heard of it before, but would you recommend to have it, like, create those digital books separately, or if the, f if the app has a function to create books within it? If you have a function that you can create books that Can you use the mic, please, yeah. Caroline? They can't hear you so, on the live oh, stream. Right. Can you Sorry use the mic, that. please? Sorry. Thank um, you. So the, the question was, if you have an app, uh, an app, so she has uh, NovaChat, that really supports uh, creating books that can be read, to, that can have uh, oral reading of the book, could you do that instead of having a separate app? Absolutely. If, it's, if it works well within your app and then they have it with them all the time. Uh, so, you know, I see students who have some of their books on their, on their app and some of their books on a separate iPad with, with an app for social interaction because then you can, the, the reason that I sometimes like it on a separate one is that then you're, you can look, talk about the book, you can read the book and talk about it with somebody at the same time. So you're, you're not having to go back and forth from your language for interacting to your book. And so, you know, just think about that when you're making the books. Thank you. What's the purpose of this book? If it's for self-directed, they're not using their language to talk, they're just listening to the book. But if it's for having a conversation, then I like to have it on a separate one. Next. Next question. These are really great questions, by the way. Coming, I'm coming. I just have a question for emergent readers who are device users in terms of what, whether there's been anything studied about what's more effective for our AAC users reading, whether it's using like a finger or a hand to actually point to the text to read along, or whether it's using their device to fill in a word, you know, in a repetitive text right. or something like that. So I don't think we have great research telling us yet, and so I'm gonna be going with, with my gut. I, I find that repetition with variety, so that sometimes we're reading a, a book and we're, fi we're you know, filling in one word, but we're not trying to get you to read um, I like that cat. I, we, I, I don't, we don't want to do that type of thing. We might be modeling some retelling, but we're not just filling in individual words. I have found that the, the strategy that's been the most effective for me, and I, I didn't put it in here, uh, but I do story retelling using core language, where I've read a book page in a book, and then I retell that using the student's device. And I put a tip for that. I didn't put it in your Dropbox, but I will when I remember, or somebody will remind me, Karen. Um, but the, I have found that my students start using the words that I model in conversation or when we're reading books, and that reading books is a great way for me to just talk about it. Oh, she is mad. Oh, she wants more. Oh, she is, you know, so as I'm reading about Goldilocks, like, she is so hungry. Ah, oh, she's not happy. Oh, look, did you see that? that I'm modeling words and just retelling that story and I'm not trying to write, the chair broke. That's not the point of it. The point is just you know, having a conversation about this book. And that's the thing that I have found to be the most successful in helping kids to use their devices. But now if the goal is print processing, then I love them having them doing point pointing. So sort of what is the goal? And I also, love this from the dollar store, that I can highlight some words on their device and put this over their 
for whether it's letters or, or words, I can highlight some words uh, using this little uh, wand from the uh, dollar store. So I will just leave this up here on this table, and whoever gets there first can have it. Oh, well. Or on the floor. So that's so, all the okay. time that, that we yes. have today. Thank you so much, Caroline. You're welcome. My pleasure. And make sure to check out the Dropbox page that's up here. On, can we put that back up on the screen one last time if you haven't caught a snapshot of it? And remember to also, if you're interested in getting the, what's the app you're giving away? Oh, Total Talk. Total Talk. Yeah, I need it in five minutes. In so the next five minutes, 50 words or less about why you want that app and it'd be good for your kid with your name and email address so you can actually get the, uh, get the code. Do that, hand it in, and we'll get there. That's I am giving away one of those books that's going around, the Learn to Work book. I'm going to give that away to the person whose birthday is closest to today without going over. Who had a birthday like in November or already in December? Raise your hands if you had a birthday already in December. How about November? No, we have December right here, December 1st. December 1st. Okay, I, you're it, Tim. Is this a book that will be appropriate for you, that Learn to Work? Is that, would that be helpful for you guys? Okay, we'll Great. find it for you, and here's the CD that goes with it. Thanks, okay. guys. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody.